Augustina Oktoberfest beer. Welcome to another edition of Bands, Bikes and Booze Reviews. It is absolutely pissing down out there, but I don't give a fuck, because I've got a bottle of this. This is the Augustina Brow Oktoberfest beer. Now I've been trying to get hold of this stuff for ages, and I finally managed to get hold of some from Beers of Europe, I think it was. And was it Beers of Europe? Yes, it was Beers of Europe. I've got the box down there. And it's the last of the big six that I need to get hold of. And I'm really excited to try that. And when I say the big six, of course, I mean the six breweries that are based in Munich and who are the only ones allowed to sell beer in Munich during the Oktoberfest. They are Hofbrau, Paulana, Hackershaw, Augustina, Spartan and Lervenbrei. And I've reviewed all of them. If you want to look them up on the channel, have a quick search, they're all on there. I may even put all the links together and you can work it all out for yourself. But this is the last in the in the series of them. And as I say, I've been trying to get hold of it for ages and now it's finally here. Just give you a quick rundown on the brewery. Augustina, a fantastic brewery. If you look at my other reviews on the channel, they always get good marks. It's rare that they put out a bad beer. Mind you saying that, I had a vice beer that I tried the other day, and it really wasn't the same as what I remembered it, because I reviewed it on the channel, which is really good. But this one, it tasted a bit funny. I'm not sure what went on there. Maybe it might have been a rogue bottle or something like that, but it was a bit, a little bit nasty. Anyway, that's by the by. This lot have been going since 1328. Now, that is some pedigree, believe me. And yeah, it's not been continuous, but they've been, I think the, uh, the brewery has fell into a state of disrepair in the sort of 1700s or whatever. But they've been brewing a long time put it that way and they're still brewing today obviously and their brewery is has one of the biggest malting rooms in Europe so they still do their own malting now a lot of breweries just don't have the capacity to do that and when I say they don't have the capacity to do it maltings mean is when you get the malt that's been separated and you know from the chaff and it's spread out along the floor evenly very thinly along the floor and believe me, there needs to be a lot of room to do that if you're going to be brewing big batches like this lot are. But they do it. They have got the biggest, in Europe certainly, uh, malting room. And there's a lot, quite a few British brewers that do it too. And if you look at, you know, if you look up some of the photographs, you'll just get an idea of how much space you need to do that. It's basically, as I say, it's spreading it all out along the floor and they're, you know, spreading it all evenly, ready for it to go in the, in the kiln and, and then obviously into the, into the grist that is going to be boiled up. This, fam this brewery have got quite a, quite a reputation and they have done for some years. They used to supply beer to the Wisselbach family. If you don't know them, they're a, a, a royal house from Germany that were based in Bavaria and their legacy still stands today. If you look at the Bavarian coat of arms, it's got the blue and white checker sort of segment on it or flag if you like. Uh, you only have to look at Bayern Munich's uh, football kit and you can see that and you can see it on a lot of beers as well, a lot of Bavarian beers. Uh, Bayreuther is one that immediately springs to mind. I think it's on the Löwenbrau bottles as well. But, but it's quite it's quite dominant in a lot of German brewery logos. Wisselbach is where it comes from, the house of Wisselbach. And this lot, up until I think it was 1589, was it? For, yeah, 1589. Uh, they used to supply beer to the uh, that royal family in 1589. That was taken over by Hofbrau. So there you go. They've also got one of Munich's largest beer gardens. And I've just been looking up the menu for this beer garden and all their beer is around the four euro mark for a half a litre which i think mm, that's that's a little bit expensive you know because it's all made there but i bet it is definitely worth it you know you're drinking it fresh from the source 
and I would not mind trying that out one day. Also, the food looks fantastic as well, very big, hearty meals, typical German meals. But yeah, that looks really good, so that's one for the list. If I ever get over to Germany with all this fucking COVID that's going on at the moment, I am getting really sick of it. I haven't been to work since March. I'm working from home, and quite frankly, it's doing my nutting. Anyway, let's get back to the beer. Right, this is 500 ml bottle. This is 6.3%, I think it is. Yeah, 6.3. It is a Marzen, which is in keeping with the Oktoberfest beer style. Uh, if you're not sure what a Marzen is, it's a beer that's broody mates, but it's a bottom fermented beer, so arguably or technically it is a lager. It's brewed in May, and once it's brewed, it is lagered for all their months in cool cellars and then it is ready for consumption around late August, September, etc. And of course, perfectly in time for the Oktoberfest. And uh, the bottle that it's in is called the, uh, the, the Builder's Half Litre or the Construction Worker's Half Litre. There's only one other brewery that springs to mind immediately. I'm sure there's others, but Iinga are the only other one that I can think of at the top of my, off the top of my head that does it in these in these sort of dump at their world they are considered dumpy bottles in germany and that is quite retro in germany you you know a lot if you look at a lot of german beer now it's in very slender glasses you know looking up here you know the oktoberfest beer for L love and bride that is quite a slim bottle uh, the same goes for uh, tuka as well you know if, if you look at their bottles they're all they're all that, that sort of shape and then of course you've got the you've got the hacker shore stuff with a flip top lid. So, you know, they've sort of modernized their beer bottles to become trendy, but Augustina have stuck with what they know. And apparently it's, it's quite popular in Berlin as well, which is unusual for, a, um, which is unusual for a, a brewer from Bavaria. Normally, as I say, I've mentioned this a lot of times on the videos that German people are quite loyal to their local breweries, but that apparently is very, popular in Berlin. So the old Berliners are not very loyal. <laughs> Joke. Anyway, enough of my shit comedy. Let's get this beer investigated. Let's get ye oldie cap off. Right, and in case I didn't mention it, this naturally comes from Bavaria. It conforms to the Reinheitsgebot. And they do make a big thing about it on their on their caps. If you look at all their caps, they have got that, you know, the Munich Reinheitsgebot Seat 1487. Now, if that sounds a bit different to 1516, 1487, they were doing it before it became law, which I think is brilliant. Uh, let's get some of it into the glass and see what's going on. Now, I'm using an ABK glass which I've used for all of the all of the Oktoberfest beers um, I don't use Steins don't really see the point um, this is just as good right what are we getting on the nose wow that is really sweet sweet honey lovely malt grainy Pilsner Munich type malt and some, some of the hop characters come through, a bit floral and a bit herbal as well. It smells really nice, but it does have that sweetness, which a lot of Marzens do. Now, speaking of Marzens, I tried the, what was the last one I tried? <laughs> the Hackershaw stuff. That was quite dark compared to this. This is very light. It's almost like a Hellas. And... It can range from sort of amber, medium to dark amber, right through to this sort of colour, you know, the golden straw colour, which this is. So, you know, there is a bit of variation for that. There's quite a bit of carbonation going on in that. For once, the glass is reasonably clean. Oh, it just smells so nice, though. There is a lot of that... A lot of... <laughs> There's a lot of that on my nose at the moment. There's a lot of that honey sweetness, which is a mixture of the malt and the yeast that goes into these. 
and it gives it that lovely sweet, which is a bit disconcerting when you're not used to that sweetness when you when you try it first off. I got that hell of a lot with the Leuvenbroi when I tried it very first time and I give it a bit of a bad review. I said it tasted like a macro lager. That is a misconception that a lot of people get and I fell for that one as well. I've done a review, a revisiting review after it and yeah, it wasn't, believe me, that was no macro brewed lager. Anyway, let's shut up and let's get this down the hatch. Some vol, as they say in Germany. Oh wow. Cool. That is super sweet. To the point where it reminds me of a honey beer. Now I've tried the Fuller's uh, honey dew, and that is quite sweet and it's got a lot of honey style flavor on it. And this is what I'm getting from this. But on the second mouthful, you, your palate will sort of get used to it and it won't be as sweet, which is what I'm assuming. It was the same for the Leuvenbroi that I tried. God, that is nice. Wow. Oh, that is good. Plenty of biscuit malt on that as well, and a touch of caramel. So initially you're getting huge sweetness, honey style sweetness, which I think is a combination of the, the yeast that's gone into this and the malt combining to give it that lovely sweet flavor. Then you're getting the biscuit malt, which and it's, it's a cross between bread, dough, biscuit, you know that type of sweet, Pilsner type malt, Munich malt type flavour. There is a touch of caramel on that as well, which is subtle. You really have to tune in to get that. Oh. Lovely herbal notes and floral notes on that too. Again, very subtle. And it is so easy to dismiss this as a macro brewed cheap beer. But believe me, it is not. This is a really, really nice, subtle beer. Now when I say subtle, the sweetness is not subtle. That is the first thing that will hit you. But you have to look beyond that, and then you get the biscuit, the bread, the dough, the liquid bread as they call it in Germany. That's the very, very subtle caramel. Then, you know, second and third mouthful, you get in the, the subtle hops on there, and they are subtle, which give it like a floral type. A floral type sort of note on the top. And altogether, it does work. The whole combination of all of that works very nicely indeed. really getting them floral notes come through now and it's so good wow it's a different type of emphasis on each mouthful now i'm not sure whether that's my palate getting used to it and then discovering more flavors but it does taste really good There's no hint of spirit alcohol in that whatsoever. And that's 6.3%, which, you know, you could be forgiven. I've tasted Belgian blondes before. They've had the subtle spirit alcohol that's running through that. You don't get any of that at all, which in some cases can be quite dangerous because if you start caning this, you will end up coming a cropper. That really is a good combination of everything 
of all them good flavours in this. And I'm going to have to put it down because I will cane that before I've given you the verdict. But this is really good. And of course, you know, in case I didn't mention it, if you look on the, the side of the bottle, in case you didn't know, that is the EU protected status from Bavaria. So it's a genuine Bavarian beer. That is pretty damn good. So what's the verdict on Augustina Oktoberfest beer? Yeah, really good. And to be honest, all of these Oktoberfest beers from the Munich breweries have been absolutely outstanding. Each one of them has been really, really good. And I have to say, this is no exception. This has got so much going on in there. There is complexity that you will have to really tune your palate in to get all them flavours. Now, there's other beers out there, other Oktoberfest beers, or other Marzens, if you like, the Hacker Shaw, which was just upfront flavour in your face. Same with the Paulana stuff. The Hofbrauer stuff, of course, it was just everything in the first mouthful. That was truly an amazing beer. This stuff, I have to say, has got to be one of the sweetest or the sweetest out of the six. So maybe the Lervenbroi would give it a run for its money, but I think this pips it to the post. This is a fantastic Oktoberfest Marzen by anybody's standards. It really is good, I have to say. Of course, it's a 10 out of 10. There is no question about that. That is a fantastic beer, as you would expect. But, now this is this is my league table. This is the fine, finest, this is the final league table from the the Champions League of Oktoberfest breweries from Munich. So in first place, it has to go to Hofbrau. I thought their stuff was absolutely outstanding. By a Nats Chuff in second place is Hacker Shaw. And it really was a tough decision on how to work that one out. But I think Hofbrau just shaded it by the slimmest of margins. So Hacker Shaw are at number two. Lervenbroi. Number three, I still think that is one of the best as well. That really is a good one. And I had to try it twice because the first time I, I left it in the freezer to try and get it cold and I think I messed that one right up. Didn't really get it, it didn't taste proper. So I reviewed it and yeah, that was really good. In fourth place, I think I'm gonna have to put this. This is a really, really nice one, but I like that one for its subtle flavors where you have to zone in and just get all them fantastic flavors that are going on. Number five is Paulana. I was quite disappointed with Paulana because I thought they were gonna be absolutely outstanding. And the, and the reason I thought that was because I loved the Hellas that they did. I loved the Dunkel that they did. I loved the Weissbeer and I loved the Salvatore, the, uh, the Doppelbock that they did. But I thought the Oktoberfest beer wasn't up to their usual standard. That's just my personal taste. But when I say it wasn't up to their usual standard, their standard is exceptional. And this was just excellent. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it sounds like I'm knocking them. It's not, and it sounds like I'm knocking that beer. That was a fantastic beer. But when you've got competition like that, you know, you've really got to pull out all the stops. And I don't think they did quite make it up there, in my opinion. In sixth place was Spartan. Now, Spartan were good, don't get me wrong, and it was a fantastic beer, but out of all of them, I just thought, you know, this was probably the weaker of the six. But of course, it's still excellent beer, and certainly drinkable, and if, you know, if I was over in Munich at an Oktoberfest gathering, there is no way I would not be drinking Spartan beer. I'd be drinking all of them, to be honest, but because they're all good. And you know, this is a league table. This is the elite league table. When you get all beers that are 10 out of 10, and you know, you're trying to work out the best one. They're all excellent to begin with, all outstanding beers to get to begin with. So, you know, it's a real, real tough decision. And you really have to get the subtleties of the beer to work out which was best. And for me, Hofbrau done that. They were number one and they were number one from, for a while, and they were number one from the moment I tried them. 
and they didn't they didn't move off that top spot and this was the last one that was outstanding i've just tried this it's an amazing beer and i definitely definitely recommend it in fact i recommend all the munich oktoberfest beers they are all fantastic examples of marzen beer and yeah you you will not go wrong with any of them any of them six beers you are on to a winner and remember beer is working class champagne